Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. The clock is counting down to the big COP17 conference in Durban next week. In the run-up to the event, South Africa has attempted to put its greenest foot forward. Terence Kremer joins me to discuss some of the developments. Terence, welcome to Second Take. One of the major developments of the last couple of weeks was the signing of the Green Economy Accord. What does this document say about the approach that South Africa is taking? Well, the number of accords are being signed under the new growth path uh, rollout. And the new growth path, the overall ob objective is to create uh, 5 million jobs by 2020. And that, that requires us to uh, look at ways uh, or areas of the economy that can grow faster than what we have been in the past, especially in the context of you know, a slowdown since the recovery from the recession of 2009 and these massive uncertainties in the global economy at the moment where you've got a number of economies potentially going into a double dip recession, which is going to have an impact on South Africa. <clears throat> so the Green Economy Accord was the, uh, was the latest of these accords and it uh, had government, business, labor and community organizations coming together and saying that we don't only support the objectives of rolling out uh, green, clean energy and green, uh, greener in industries and uh, e economic components. But we also want to leverage that to its maximum advantage in terms of job creation. So there were a number of commitments made by everyone uh, in, in, uh, in the signing ceremony, including the renewable energy industry, which has said that 35% of the initial rollout of uh, you know, the, the, the wind farms, the solar farms that are going to come under the 3,725 megawatts of capacity that government is going to procure between next year and 2016 is going to be local content. So to try and build some of a, a something of a manufacturing base and a construction industry base around uh, the green, the renewable energy rollout. And uh, they said there's also an um, aim to you know, move towards the, gen the bigger local procurement accord aspiration of 75% over time. So that was one of the more, more firm commitments, but there were also a number of other things about trying to get the biofuels industry in South Africa moving ahead, because we've had that really stalled for a number of years. <coughs> and we now have, you know, the blending, the mandatory blending requirements is out for, they are out for um, public comment. And also, you know, looking for uh, greener transport solutions, so moving the economy uh, from road to rail, both in the, uh, on the passenger side as well as on the, the freight side. So there are a number of projects there, and some of them are really uh, large and big ticket items. And then uh, generally, the, the big uh, uh, media thrust would be around energy efficiency. Okay, we've got the solar water heater program, which uh, is hitting a few rocky patches at the moment. But generally, energy efficiency in houses, but in particular in manufacturing, in mining, uh, and in buildings, <coughs> that's a big low-hanging fruit, not only in terms of um, you know, getting our carbon emissions under control, given that we are a, a, you know, a, um, a coal-heavy country, so the less you consume what they call megawatts, the, the better. Uh, for the whole economy and the more efficient we will be, especially in the context of rising electricity prices. But also energy efficiency seems to have a lot of jobs potential. Uh, it's one of the most the jobs intensive aspects of the uh, sort of the whole renewable energy environment. So it's energy, you know, in South Africa, that's the big ticket one, but there are transport elements. There's elements around public works, especially around maintaining green infrastructure or uh, getting, you know, taking out alien vegetation, etc. It's also quite job rich. So there's a number of that. But basically what it's saying is that all the social partners have bought into the idea that the green economy can be an economic stimulus, but that we also need to use it to, to its maximum advantage to leverage jobs and growth. The World Bank also put out its own document on the green economy. What did it have to say on the matter? I think it, it dovetails quite neatly with the, um, what came out of the Green Economy Accord, saying that you know, it's part of an element um, of different growth and job creation strategies that South Africa needs to adopt, as well as environmental protection policies. So the Green Economy uh, on its own, uh, in isolation, is, is no silver bullet. I mean, the, the, you know, even the Green Economy Accord is only talking about 300,000 jobs from the Green Economy between now and 2020 in the context of what they're wanting to create 
uh, five million jobs. So it's still, you know, it's it's still modest. And I think the, uh, the the report highlights that their costs and benefits are pursuing, for instance, renewable energies ahead of conventional energy sources, and South Africa will have to weigh those up. But on the whole, the report says there are a number of co-benefits associated with uh, pursuing policies, uh, the green economy policies, for instance, like renewable energy, although it might raise some of the, the prices around electricity, there's a lot of environmental benefits, especially in a context of a country that's so coal heavy. So there's air quality and water quality benefits. And there's also that diversification of the energy mix, which is seen as quite an important imperative for South Africa, given that 95% of our electricity is now coming from coal. And it's going to be more and more difficult, I think, to fund coal-fired power stations in the future. We already saw a lot of hoo-ha around uh, the money flowing from the World Bank to the Kusile and Madupe power stations. So I think South Africa realizes they're going to have to pursue a different mix, and imported hydro is a big uh, element of that, but so is the renewable energy program. doesn't mean that coal is out. Um, in any, by any means, it's going to be a very part of our, uh, important part of our mix for many, many years. But there is this desire to lower the intensity of coal. And the World Bank saying that's important. They also say one of the key instruments is that you need to have a visible and transparent price for carbon. And this is a contentious issue. So in the context of, uh, of COP next week and the fact that it's unlikely that we're going to get a legally binding agreement in terms of emission reductions, the, most countries are looking at you know, the opportunity side of the green economy equation rather than the threat because the stick isn't going to really arrive, uh, I don't think, from COP17. So people are just more or less looking at you know, we, what we have to do, the right things for the, the future of the economy because these future threats, the climate threats, I think there's a lot of worry around that, but the future threats to trade and, and investment, like Eskom having to raise money for coal-fired power stations, are real and they're really present. Uh, so I think there's, there's a view that we have to try and uh, look at ways to integrate these renewable energy technologies and other um, green economy technologies into the economy. But I think, I think the overarching message is, yes, price carbon, um, and you can use, they also say there's potentially a a uh, benefit of imp implementing a carbon tax, even if the world doesn't go ahead with a transparent carbon price, saying that you can use that revenue you know, to lower um, taxes that are currently growth and job inhibiting. Uh, so talking about really a revenue neutral tax, so not just raising money, additional money, but finding ways to cut in other places. But they do say it, it is a fairly ambitious thing for South Africa to be pursuing because um, it's the only really emerging market economy to even be looking at a carbon tax seriously. We saw Australia has pursued it and Europe's got something of a carbon price. And I think we're going to have the next <coughs> iteration of the National Treasury's carbon tax document in the next few weeks. That's going to be interesting to see how they've changed from last year's version. And I think then we're going to have a lot of responses from the business community, a lot more serious responses saying, yes, I think uh, business is going to agree, let's have a price for carbon, let's make it transparent, let's make the choices that we are making around renewable energy transparent in terms of that's the price that we're putting to, to carbon emission reductions. But they are going to very much kick and scream with regard to the imposition of a carbon tax, which has the potential again to you know, displace the productive sectors of this economy and take it to other parts of the world that aren't necessarily very e e efficient in the conversion, for instance, of South Africa's raw materials. And we could actually, by introducing a carbon tax, I think business is going to argue, add to the emissions problem because we are more efficient in converting chrome ore, manganese ore, than it would might be the case in a place like India or China. Finally, Terence, even ESCOM is undertaking some green initiatives. Can you tell us more? Yes, Eskom, you know, is the big pariah, and I think they've had to increase their security over the COP17 period. We noticed that this week in trying to get into Megawatt Park, there's a serious uh, beefing up of security because they realize that uh, activists could be attacking their facilities or approaching their facilities, as we saw with the Kusile power station recently. Uh, but they are also saying that they're wanting to do more in terms of lowering their coal emissions. They they burn a lot of coal every year, and they emit something like 200 and 
30 million tons of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere every year, which is by far South Africa's single largest emitter of carbon dioxide. So they are so looking at their power station fleet and the internal demand and looking at ways to reduce the amount of carbon emissions that they are pushing out from their, from them, uh, from their own consumption. So we've seen um, Eskom invest in three solar projects over the last few months. Two of them are next to power stations, one at Kendall, uh, one uh, out at Latabo, and at their own head office in Megawatt Park. We saw yesterday, this week, uh, the, um, the, the solar photovoltaic system being installed there. And that's really to try and reduce their internal consumptions and will, uh, reduce it from coal and to consume it from cleaner sources of energy so that they can lower their, 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 their emissions from their power stations as well as from their office blocks, etc. But it's a long, you know, it's a small drop in the ocean if you compare it to what they're look, talking about, a couple of thousand tons a year that they would save from these pilot projects. But they're looking at a number of other initiatives. One is looking to co-fire coal with some biomass, which can help in uh, reducing their emissions. But uh, overall, they're coal heavy. They are a big coal consumer. And in fact, um, if you look at their, uh, their interim results that came out this week, you know, coal is now nine, over, over 19 cents uh, of in terms of their cost of production of 33 cents. That's the single largest element in, um, uh, in their cost of production. They sell at about 55 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's still a very coal heavy utility. And coal and rising coal costs are a big concern for them and a big burden for them. And uh, they also know in terms of their image and their future sustainability, they're going to have to be looking at uh, alternative solutions, renewables being one, and they've got two utility scale, not these small pilot plants, but utility scale projects that will be going up over the next couple of years. A wind farm, 100 megawatts at Syria in the Western Cape, and a concentrating solar uh, power plant, which is a south solar tower concept up in Uppington, the sun-drenched Uppington, which has apparently got the best solar radiation in the world. That could also go up in the next couple of years. It's a bit more of a complex project. They've raised a lot of development finance for those initiatives. They've got money from the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Clean Technology Fund, and basically the, the wind project is fully funded. They're looking for a bit more uh, in terms of the uh, CSP pro project. But that looks like they are, they are looking like they're going to secure that funding. So you can see they've got some ambitions there. And then obviously, uh, there are a lot of questions about whether they'll be allowed to move ahead with nuclear it is a way of, uh, of reducing their reliance on coal. And that's going to be a very hot debate. Uh, we're going to have to wait for cabinet approval on that. And then obviously, you're going to have to go through the environmental process and the co public consultation, which is going to be heated. And uh, I think that's going to all probably take place during the course of next year. Terence, thank you very much. That is the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.